the concept is basically this. Wherever you go in the world, you find two types of people that are socialists, that are socialists, Marxists, communists, revolutionaries. On the one hand, you have a middle-class strata of people uh, who are angry at injustice. And this exists in any country in the world, capitalist, socialist, wherever you go. You find people that are middle-class, usually younger. Some of them grow out of it, some of them don't. They're angry at injustice, they want to change the world, and they're rebellious, they want to tear things down, they want to fight injustice, they want to be heroic. Um, that exists wherever you go, right? And it's usually less than 1% to 10% of the population. That always exists, right? And, you know, let's be real, that's where the Bolsheviks came from, uh, that's who Fidel Castro was, that's who Che Guevara was, that, that it's important, you can't ignore it. Um, and that, you know, a lot of the socialist movements, historically, you have that layer of middle class radicals, uh, middle-class youth radicals who want to change the world. However, they are incapable of making a revolution. They, they are just a small sector of society. The folks that are key in making socialist revolutions happen are not the university students who, who are full of rage and injustice, want to tear things down and change the world and fight for justice. Revolutions are made by the broad masses of people by the broad masses of people. That's who makes revolutions. By the broad masses of people. That is who makes revolutions happen. And the broad masses of people make revolutions for very different reasons, right? That bohemian middle class left, they're young, they're angry, they wanna go down and tear things down, they wanna be heroic. But the people who actually make the revolutions are people who aren't generally interested in politics, until they're suffering. And when a capitalist crisis comes, the broad masses of people are suffering. And their lives become unstable. You know, they can't get a job. They can't feed their kids. They're being sent to die in wars. Society is coming apart. And they turn to socialism and Marxism because they want order. They want to have food. They want to they feed their kids. They want to not be afraid. They want the economy to be organized to serve public good. They want socialism because they want order. Right? And the brilliance of Lenin was that he was able to organize that bohemian middle class in Russia, that's who the Bolsheviks were, to affect the broad masses of people. Right? The peace, land, and bread. You read the April Thesis, right? The people of, of, of Russia didn't want to keep fighting in the war. They were hungry. The peasants wanted land. So Lenin told, got this organization of middle class kind of bohemians and labor activists, labor unions were a big part of the Bolsheviks, to go out and build a party that would seize, you know, the desire, you know, for order, and they were able to take power, right? But these two souls within socialism, these two trends within socialism, didn't go away. Trotsky was very much a representative of that bohemian middle class that wants to behead every last king, tear down every last wall, go out and fight like crazy. That's why he wanted permanent revolution. He wanted the Soviet Union to be just a temporary holdout in a global you know, crusade to spread communism all over the world. He wanted to militarize the entire country. He wanted, he wanted you know, blood. That's what Trotsky was about, permanent revolution. Whereas... Stalin was for socialism in one country. And he was saying, okay, we have the Soviet Union. Let's build a socialist society in the Soviet Union. Let's have peace with the West. Let's bring in some foreign experts to help us build our industries. And let's build a prosperous society in the Soviet Union. And the overwhelming majority of the people living in the Soviet Union favored Stalin's position. They were tired of war. The Russian Civil War was horrendous. Millions of people died. They didn't have medicine. Stalin won out. But in a way, Stalin was quite conservative. Stalin, you know, during the 1920s, the Bolsheviks had very, very liberal sexual policies, right? They had, you know, homosexuality was legal, and there was, you know, a talk of abolishing marriage and all of that. Well, Stalin instituted the Soviet family, which was a mother and a father and kids. Now, the mother and father were both working. Women could go to university and get degrees, but they glorified the Soviet household, the Soviet family. Stalin outlawed abortion. Let's remember, Stalin outlawed homosexuality. Um, and that, you know, that Stalin also, in a lot of ways, brought back a lot of the admiration 
for Russia's history. There were movies made in Russia that glorified the old czars, for example, right? And he, he appealed to Russian nationalism, right? And they, they, Alexander Nevsky and Ivan the Terrible, you watch movies from the Stalin era, they're glorifying Russia's history and Russian culture, right? And that there was a conservative side to Stalin because he was a break. Stalin was a break with that, that middle-class trend, right? That's just the reality. Stalin was, Stalin was a synthesis, right? You had the Bolsheviks that were these ultra-liberal, middle-class bohemians. You had the Russian people who wanted stability and peace and had turned to the Bolsheviks to get out of the crisis of World War I and economic famines and all kinds of hardships. So Stalin was the synthesis. He was a combination. On the one hand, he represented Marxism, which is the most radical far-left thing, but he also represented the soul of the Russian people which is deeply conservative and longing for stability and a civilization that lasts thousands of years. Stalin was a synthesis, right? That's the reality. And, you know, after the Second World War was over, American intelligence agencies became very well familiar with the reality that there were two contradictory souls within socialism. Socialist countries... Socialist revolutions are made by millions of people who want to get out of the crisis of capitalism. But socialist movements, you know, socialist parties tend to be very popular among this middle class that wants chaos and wants instability. So there are two contradictory souls within socialism. And there always will be. I mean, there's, that's just a reality. There always will be two contradictory souls within socialism. But the U.S., intelligence agencies figured out a mechanism for manipulating the first tendency. They figured out how to manipulate the middle class, student, rebel, that faction. And they worked really hard at it and they brag about this. I know this sounds like a conspiracy theory, folks. I know that, okay? He's talking about CIA and... Google, just Google right now the phrase Congress for Cultural Freedom. Congress for Cultural Freedom. The first thing that will come up is CIA.gov. CIA.gov. Smoking gun. And they brag about how the CIA launched a program, 1951, called the Congress for Cultural Freedom. And on that website, who, who do they quote? Sidney Hook. Sidney Hook. Hook, a Trotskyite, Trotskyite professor in New York City. And that there was a huge effort to manipulate that bohemian middle-class radical strata and turn them against socialist countries. The Congress for Cultural Freedom was an entity created by the CIA with millions of dollars that funneled money into art galleries, into all kinds of things, into, you know, movie, you know, experimental filmmakers, the Frankfurt School, which was a, a Marxist school of cultural criticism in Germany, the art of Jackson Pollock. There was a Trotskyite magazine called Partisan Review that was distributed on the college campuses all across the United States. And it was about manipulating the, the middle-class revolutionary intelligentsia to oppose the socialist countries, and, and expanding that contradiction between countries that are striving to build socialism and middle-class radicals. And the result has been the creation of an entity called the synthetic left. There is an entity now walking around that calls itself the left, and it is not left. It is not the left. There is an entity walking around that calls itself left-wing, that calls itself socialist, that calls itself left, and it's not left. It's anti-Marxist. It's anti-socialist. It's anti-historical progress. There is a, a bizarre bohemian death cult that exists in the Western world that is the creation of of the CIA, it's a result of all kinds of CIA money and such, that walks around, it is anti-populist, it hates average working people, 
and it walks around and calls itself the left, and it's not the left. The Communist Party USA of the 1930s was an amazing organization of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people who wanted to build socialism. The, you know, the Socialist Party of Eugene Debs, an amazing organization of millions of people that wanted to build socialism. The, you know, the Wobblies, the IWW, amazing organization, right? The, you know, there was attempts in the new communist movement of the 70s to build something like the Communist Party USA or the Socialist Party again, right? That such things, you know, the left has existed. But this entity that walks around the Western world, this entity, this counterculture, really counterculture is what it is. That entity is not the left. It's, the difference between left and right is this, progress. It always has been, right? The reason that they came up with the concept of left and right was in France, after the French Revolution, they formed a national assembly. And the people that were loyal to the king and feudalism in the old system, they sat on the right. And those that were enthusiastic and supportive of the French Revolution and the modern world and marching into the future, they sat on the left. If you're a conservative, you want to go backward, you sit on the right. If you believe in historical progress and getting to a higher form of civilization, you sit on the left. That's the difference between left and right. Are you for progress or are you against it? Right? And this entity emerged in the Western world that does not believe in historical progress. Let me repeat. There is an entity that emerged in the Western world funded by the CIA, funded by the intelligence agencies, that does not believe in historical progress. And that is not the left. That is the synthetic left. And this is probably the most clear manifesto of what they believe that I have ever read. It's called The Aquarian Conspiracy by Marilyn Ferguson. Marilyn Ferguson is a spiritual guru. She was the spiritual guru of Al Gore, right? She visited the White House and hung out with Al Gore. Right? This book is endorsed by all the CIA intellectuals. Carl Rogers, uh, a, a, you know, a, a psychologist with all kinds of ties to the intelligence agencies. Arthur Kessler, who published a, an anti-communist book for the CIA called The God That Failed. It was like an anti-communist manifesto. Right? You, know, you read this. This book by Marilyn Ferguson, the spiritual advisor of Al Gore, is not Marxism. This is not Marxism. This does not believe in historical progress. This is not left. This is a demented death cult. This is a demented death cult. It is people who want to destroy human progress. And they have taken the place of the left. I'll read to you from it. A leaderless but powerful network is working to bring radical change in the United States. Its members have broken with certain key elements of Western thought, and they may even have broken with the continuity of history. That's the first sentence of the book. A leaderless but powerful network is working to bring radical change in the United States. That's sentence number one. Sentence number two. Its members have broken with certain key elements of Western thought, and they may have even broken with the continuity of history. It goes on. There are school teachers, office workers, famous scientists, government officials, lawmakers, artists, millionaires, taxi drivers, celebrities, leaders in medicine, education, law, and psychology. Some are open in their advocacy and their names and may be familiar. There are legions of conspirators. There are corporations, universities, hospitals, on the faculties of public schools. Um, they're in the White House staff. They're in state legislatures, in volunteer organizations. You read this. This, this, is, this is what the synthetic left is. This is the most blatant manifesto. 1981, I believe it was published. The paradigm of the Aquarian conspiracy sees humankind as embedded in nature. It promotes autonomous individuals in a decentralized society. Human nature is neither good nor bad, but the continuous transformation of, and transcendence. Right? 
And where is ground zero for the, the you know, Aquarian conspiracy that she spends this whole book describing? America is free, but California is freer. If America is open to innovation, innovation is California's middle name. California. And who is carrying out these operations in California? Right? In California, we are creating an aristocracy, a new aristocracy, an aristocracy of those who care. Membership is restricted only by capacity for concern. And who is carrying it out? Who is carrying it out? In Santa Barbara, the Center for the Study of Democratic Institutions, the Center for the Advanced Study in Behavioral Sciences in Palo Alto, and the Stanford Research Institute. CIA think tanks. The think tanks of Western capitalism are carrying out the Aquarian conspiracy. And what is further evidence that in the last chapter, the whole Earth conspiracy, it exists around the world. What's central to it? The Club of Rome. The Club of Rome. Who are the Club of Rome? The Club of Rome, they wrote a book called The Limits to Growth. And they said that the human population is just too big. There are too many people. And we need to drastically reduce the human population. We need to drastically end technology. This entity, created by Western intelligence agencies, is walking around pretending to be Marxism, pretending to be socialism, pretending to be the left. The Aquarian conspiracy, created by Western intelligence agencies, and they... They don't believe in essential aspects of Marxism. Historical progress is the essence of Marxism. They don't believe in historical progress. History's gone too far. It's the Tower of Babel. They worship primitivism. Right? And if you look at them, who are some of the, the most beloved figures on the synthetic left? The Dalai Lama, who presided over a feudal, oppressive regime in Tibet that tortured people, you know, I mean, is working, you know, waged an ugly civil war in Tibet in the 1950s when hundreds of thousands of people died, you know, was trying to keep feudalism intact in Tibet. Who else is a big central part of the synthetic left? The Hare Krishna movement, one of the most right-wing traditionalist Hindu sects in India. Somehow they're a big part of what it means to be a leftist in the United States, right? Julius Evola, you know the name Julius Evola? He was one of the main ideologues of Italian fascism. He wrote a book called Revolt Against the Modern World. Revolt Against the Modern World. And if you read it, it's all about admiring, admiring feudalism, right? The Tibetan regime where, you know, there was no strikes or protests. It was so authoritarian. The Indian caste system is so beautiful. Eastern mysticism, all of this stuff that was associated with fascism in the 30s has entered the left. These entities that walk around that don't believe in historical progress, that believe there are too many people in the world, that believe that we need to go back to nature, we need to go back to some kind of Eastern primitivism, that, that primitivism is beautiful, modernity is evil, that favor destruction want to reduce the human population, that entity is walking around calling itself left. It is not left. It is the synthetic left. It is a middle-class movement that is trying to drastically reduce the human population, that is trying to beat back socialism and destroy historical progress. It's the synthetic left. It was intentionally created by the CIA, and it considers communism, actual communism, to be fascism. Susan Sontag, declared that communism is nothing but the most effective form of fascism, right? They think that if you're an actual communist, you're a Nazi. And you'll notice all over the internet, anyone who is anti-imperialist suddenly gets called a red-brown, right? There's a lot of nasty stuff said about me, a lot of nasty stuff said about Max Blumenthal, a lot of nasty stuff said about anyone who won't join them. If you still believe in socialism, if you still believe in historical progress, if you defend socialist states, people, countries that are trying to raise themselves up from poverty, you are declared to be a fascist because according to the synthetic left, communism 
actual Marxist governments are merely the most effective form of fascism. That's what these people believe. That is what they believe. Right? The people who saved the world from Hitler, the Soviet Union, the anti-fascist underground fighters in, in Germany that blew up armaments factories, that freed Jews from the concentration camps, they're all only the most successful form of fascism. That's what these people believe, that communism is just the most successful form of fascism. In my book, I quote extensively from Susan Sontag. Susan Sontag, made famous by the CIA Partisan Review, you know, they go after me, they go after Max Blumenthal, they go after the Workers' Party of Belgium, they go after the CPGBML and Jyoti Brar, they go after George Galloway. Anyone who is genuinely a socialist gets declared by these people to be a fascist because they have usurped, they declare that they are the left. They are the left, right? They are the left. This cult, this death cult that doesn't believe in historical progress that wants to tear things down, that wants poverty. They have declared that they are the left. And if you maintain, if you still believe that the workers should control the means of production and that human history isn't over and that we can advance and we can get beyond the horrors of capitalism, they say that you're a fascist. Meanwhile, why is it that Donald Trump and the, the new right has hijacked all the working class anger? Because the left has been destroyed. And this entity that tells the working class they should be poorer, because that's good for Mother Nature, um, that, they're, that they deserve to be poorer, um, I mean, th this entity that wants chaos and instability, this entity that wants to destroy Western civilization and go back to nature, this entity, this entity is not appealing to working people. I, I tell people to imagine this. Imagine that, you know, some average American working class family they're at their house one day. And all of a sudden their doorbell rings. Bing bong. Someone's knocking on the door. Uh, who is it? Oh, hi. I'm from the local socialist and communist organization. Oh, I, I've never met an actual socialist or communist before. Tell me what you believe. Well, um, we believe that this house you have, uh, it, it shouldn't, you shouldn't live in it. Uh, because material things are, are too good. We want, we, you should be poorer. Um, and in fact, the land that your house is on was stolen from Native Americans. Um, and on top of that, you know, uh, you, you make too much money at your job. Um, and uh, while we're at it, uh, this, this American flag you've got hanging in your, in your living room, hanging out in front of your, your house, we're going to burn it. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, you, you have too much stuff. And uh, we want to destroy your life because you don't deserve it because you're a disgusting Euro settler and you value things over people and we want to make you poorer. And we're having a riot tonight around six o'clock. Uh, we're going to have a riot and we're going to fight with local law enforcement and we're going to, to, to burn down and destroy a lot of buildings and beat some people up. So uh, you're interested in joining our group, aren't you? Yeah, there you go, folks. That's why the working class is turning to Trump. Because this entity, this death cult, this disgusting death cult has taken the place of actual socialism. No one in their right mind wants to join a group that wants to destroy their standard of living, that wants utter chaos and destruction, that hates them. The fake left hates the working class. There's too many of them. They're useless eaters. They need to reduce the human population. They need, this is a cult. This is a disgusting cult. This death cult, this chaotic death cult, the synthetic left, has taken the place of the actual left. It wants to drive the standard of living down. It, it admires primitivism. It wants chaos. That's not socialism. Folks, I will read to you. I will read to you. You want to know, back in the day when the Communist Party of the United States was big and it was powerful, was their message to average Americans, we want you to be poorer, we want to tear down society and make chaos? No. Their message was, we will make your life better. And in fact, I have here, if I can get it out here, this was the, the election manifesto of the Communist Party USA in 1940. Right? The presidential campaign of the Communist Party, the way out, right? Capitalism was making lives workers, the lives of workers unstable. You know, it was a Great Depression. People were losing their jobs and homes and leading to a new war. 
And the message of the Communist Party was that they, they represent the way out. Right? It's fascinating. You read, read the election manifesto of the Communist Party from the 1940s. The way out, right? In the 1932 presidential campaign, their slogan was a revolutionary way out of the crisis. And what did the Communist Party do? Did they go and burn shit and beat people up? And no, they organized unemployment councils. When people were hungry, they fed them and they organized them to fight back and demand, they, they fought for the rights of veterans. You know, veterans benefits. The reason that veterans in the United States have veterans benefits is because of the bonus march, right? The bonus march that was organized by communists, right? This was, you know, the Black Panthers, the Black Panther Party, what did they do? They had a free breakfast program. They fed hungry children. They fed hungry children. Right? The Black Panthers, what did they do? Did they want chaos? No. They wore uniforms. Military uniforms. Do you think any leftist group in the United States would ever wear uniforms? Oh no, we can't be all dressing the same. That's fascism. That's communism. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. Uh, maybe I've spent too much long talking about this. But regardless, if you look at what the Black Panthers were, right? You read about how they denounced Eldridge Cleaver for his ultra-left adventurism and his fetish for violence. They denounced the Weather Underground for their terrorist campaign, right? You read about the Communist Party USA and how they organized in a time of crisis to, to feed the hungry people, right? They said, don't starve, fight, organize ordinary people to fight for their economic interests. It was amazing stuff, right? That was a real left. And the synthetic left needs to be gotten rid of. We need a real left. And I have tried to popularize the slogan to express a real left. We need a government of action to fight for working families.